Koberger. So after beginning his career in San Francisco, uh, working with startups and bigger companies like Mozilla, uh, he founded README because he thought APIs were too complicated and realized documentation was the best place to start. Uh, he also chose the name so that his company gets free advertising whenever people see README files in the next folder they unzip. That's a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> in his spare time, he drinks a lot of tea and obsessively competes for swarm mare ships, which I have absolutely no idea what that is. Uh, he's dialing in today from Scat Scattercoke. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, New York, and I'll and we'll be discussing the topic of designing for developers. Uh, welcome, Greg. Thanks for your time. I'll hand it over to you. Sounds good. Um, I don't know where that uh, intro came from, but I'll take it. Um, and uh, you were right. The README name is perfect. Uh, all my friends, I'll get a text all the time, going watching like Mr. Robot or something, and say. Oh my god! I saw that you were sponsoring Mr. Robot or something, and I was like, "Yeah, I, I know," <laughs> but it was just uh, you know code flashing up on the screen. All right, hello I'm API welcome. Days Australia. Um, I'm coming to you from San Francisco. Unfortunately, um, I signed up for this talk because I had never been to Australia, and I had still never been to Australia. So um, uh, that's uh, unfortunately we couldn't make it in person. So my name is Gregory Koberger, and I'll be your guide for the next 20 minutes or so, plus five to 10 minutes of, of Q and A. Um, I am the founder of README. So we build the UI for APIs, from docs to community to dashboard to tools for understanding how people are using you. README handles everything that is not the API itself. Today, we're gonna talk about designing for developers. My background is in engineering, but early on I switched to design. I've done both really heavily over the years and developer experience is one of the most exciting areas of UX right now. We aren't just making something for our users, we're enabling others to build an infinite number of things. So you won't need Figma for this talk. We'll mostly be talking about UX, not pretty visual design. Now, this talks to me a bit interactive, so you'll need two things in a minute. First, uh, you're gonna wanna go to apidays.readme.com. Uh, you can do that right now so you're ready. And second, you're gonna need to make an API call, so have whatever CLI or program you use ready to go. So developers are often your most important customers. They're the hardest to get, and they have to buy into you and spend expensive development time on you. They're the slowest to leave since they're so tied to you. And they're the quickest to get upset because anything that you break or mess up reflects badly on them. But ultimately, it's a symbiotic relationship that makes both you and them stronger. Yet, always stress over user experience for consumer products. It's way too easy to adopt the attitude of developers will figure it out. But just because developers can bang their head against the wall doesn't mean they want to. At the end of the day, most people are driven towards building something, not trying to decipher your stupid error messages. So while it seems like usability might not matter to developers, that's a false, cor false correlation. Rather, developers happen to be able to overcome usability at a level that makes it seem like usability doesn't matter. When a developer is determined and skilled enough, they can figure pretty much anything out. So any developer tool can get a trickle of motivated users, and then you feel like you've hit a bit of a maxima. You think programming is hard, it's supposed to be hard, so our tool's right on track. Uh, but in truth, developers have some of the highest standards for experience. They don't choose products with bad usability because they don't care. They do it because it's all that that's available to them sometimes. All right. So now when we create our API uh, or any sort of developer tool, sometimes we kind of confuse the term developer tool with, let's just expose as much raw, rough material as possible and expect our users to make something beautiful. So we give them a bunch of tools to use and then hope that they come up with something absolutely beautiful. But that's not usually the case. Uh, when we expect them to do something beautiful, but don't give them the, the tools to get there, uh, and just give them the raw materials, we don't get anything good out of them. There's a time we could get by with a crappy PDF filled with some API parameters listed, and developers would take it from there. But not anymore. The standard for developer tools is rising. Uh, people now have to have the same standard. People now have the same tool. Ah, sorry. People now have the same standard for developer tools as they do for other products in their life. And the rules of user experience are a bit different when you're working with developers, but the standards are exactly the same. So it's important to remember: nobody wants to use your API. They want to do something, and your API happens to be the best way for them to do it. So make it easy for them. Often it feels like usability means taking something hard and making it easy. When it comes to developer experience though, it's easy, uh, easy is often out of the question. Instead, there's good hard and there's bad hard. In other words, let's call it complexity versus difficulty. Both are seemingly meaning the same thing, they mean the opposite of simple, but one is what we're striving for and the other is what we're avoiding. Since we're uh, dealing with developer tools, there's always going to be a certain amount of complexity involved. Developer tools can move up and down the complexity scale as needed, but we should rigorously remove any sort of difficulty. Now, I know I've missed you a bit uh, because that's a bit nuanced. 
When something is complex, it's a sprawling tapestry of tools or tricks, each way to be explored and mastered. It's challenging, but it helps you level up. Learning a new programming language or learning Git or Vim can be like this. It makes no sense at first, but the more work you put into it, the more you get out of it. When something's difficult, however, it's more like a large boulder in the middle of the road. Once you get past it, you feel no joy, and you're no more equipped for the journey ahead. You're just a step closer. This is kind of like fixing an obscure error message that you spent two hours in Stack Overflow trying to figure out. Sure, you're further ahead, but the only thing you really learned is that you want to merge with the developer who thought error 832p was enough information for you to go by. When we build developer experiences, we need to embrace the complexity of it. It's going to happen since we're building tools rather than products, but it's the difficulty that we're looking to avoid. There's a lot of talks today and tomorrow about designing a good API, but there's one problem with APIs. Once you have even one user, you're stuck. You can't really make any breaking changes pretty much ever. And you're at an API conference, so there's a really good chance that you already have an API. So you're probably just sitting there kind of thinking like, yeah, that would have been a great idea, but not much I can do about it now. But don't fret. I've designed this talk around the assumption that you can't make any changes to your API that'll break anything. So we're gonna talk about two main things today, documentation and error messages. Now let's talk about the APIs themselves first. It's supposed to be easy, right? Uh, you just make a request to a URL and you get a structured response back. But in reality, APIs are never actually that simple. Somewhere along the line, we've made the simple concept so complicated. Like, let's look at just sending data to an API. There's over six different ways to send data on each request. Query params, embody params, form data, cookies, headers, path params. And they're all serialized in a completely different format. That's crazy, but we all just accept it. APIs aren't complicated because they have to be. They're complicated because we don't work hard enough to make them simple. I'm not against REST or anything like that more than I am against TCP IP, for example. I just don't think everyone needs to see the nuts and bolts every single time. Remember, the only goal of your API is to be used. Yet somehow we put a ton of roadblocks up and make it a torturous experience. Let's do a quick exercise. Close your eyes and think about your favorite I or API on the internet. Just imagine your favorite API. Now, I bet you weren't envisioning the API itself, but the documentation. That's because the documentation is the UI or the UX for your API. It can make or break your API more than absolutely anything else. I'm sure there's many of you who learn a program from a book like this. And while when we went from analog to digital, for some reason, we didn't really innovate. We just moved the same paragraphs of text, organized mostly the same way online, and we call it documentation now. And I love books. We know so much about the people using an API or code library now. Developer hubs should show rather than tell, but more on that in a minute. First, like I said before, we're going to write some code. So uh, head over to, uh, if you want to play along, apidays.review.com uh, and get ready. We're going to have a friendly little competition to see who can make an API call first. Uh, so in just a moment, the website will be refreshed, and you'll be able to use it. You'll have about two minutes. And while this is happening, I'm going to play a song I read about APIs. So if you don't want to play along, you can just listen to the music. Ready, set, go. Last night when I sent you a request, you returned the status quo. One I didn't expect. Everything used to be 200, okay. But now you've 410 gone away. When we first met, you were pretty skeptic. But my 429, too many requests. Were 202 accepted? We started out as friends and then we became lovers But now you want to 303 See others I can't believe you won't be coming around Our 403 forbidden love is now 404 not found Drew we'd been having a few 409 conflicts But it wasn't anything A 408 timeout couldn't fix Situations change But I feel the same Inside my love for you Is 304 not modified I hope this all Was just a 302 Temporary But now You 301 moved on To permanently 
I can't believe you won't be coming around Our 403 forbidden love is now 404 not found Sure we've been having a few 409 conflicts But it wasn't anything for a week time out couldn't fix Everything used to be 200 okay But now you 410 Gone away Oh now you 410 410 Gone away All right, I paused the docs for a second. Uh, we got about two people actually making API requests properly. Um, but don't worry, we'll get back to this in a second and we can try it again if you didn't get it. That was not a pleasant experience for anyone going along with that. Uh, you're stuck running around trying to find clues in different places and bringing them all together. You have to set up a full dev environment or at the very least terminal or postman. You probably had to Google the curl arguments or something. It was a bit like an escape room, right? But a lot less fun. There's no reason it has to be that hard though. The docs were terrible, but they aren't far off from what most docs out there are like. I just use common tropes I see all the time in API documentation. So I'm gonna do it one more time, except I'm gonna make some changes to the documentation first. There haven't been any improvements to the API itself. It's still pretty crappy. We're just fixing the documentation. You can still watch along your browser as I fix up the API docs. You can see as I add things uh, to the docs. Uh, so go to apidays.readme.com for that. All right, so first I'm gonna put all the info you need to make this API call on every single page. When we read documentation, we structure it a certain way still, like a book where we try to reuse content as little as possible. But that's not how people want to read your documentation. They want to go to a certain page, start there, either because it seemed like the page they wanted, they got there via Google, whatever else. No one wants to jump around looking for clues. It costs nothing to include the same information on every single page over and over again, so that each documentation page is self-containing. Next, I have a foolproof trick for you. It doesn't matter how horribly bad your API is, there's one surefire way to make sure it's easy to use, no matter how convoluted or complicated it is. Code samples. Rather than forcing people to cobble together requests on their own, we cut out so much work by just giving them a code snippet that runs. So I've added one to our docs. I only did Node, but you should have as many languages as possible. Having a code sample removes so much ambiguity. How should things be encoded? What should be included and where? One line of code can remove a paragraph of explanation text. Notice that has our API key right in it. When we play again, you're going to be able to try that API key without leaving the page. You'll be able to just hit try it now, and it'll make a request for you. Next. I've updated the parameters to let you edit them right in the spot. Let people treat your code snippets in real time. It reduces so much complexity in trying to describe something. Remember, we're trying to show, not tell. And lastly, I've added a section for logs. This is so you can debug what's actually going on in real time. APIs are a black box. You send enough data and hope that something positive comes of it. Showing API logs to a user removes so much of that uncertainty. Everyone can see exactly what's happening. If you use Readme's API, for example, you're going to get a link to logs right in every response. So you can look at it, see what the server sees, and even share that log with support for help debugging. Look how much we change the docs to show rather than tell. We don't make people jump around like a book. Uh, there's so much more we can do with documentation to make it feel interactive and tailored to each individual. So we shouldn't settle for the limitations of a book. We know if it's someone's first time or if it's their 50th. We know if they need an API key, uh, or we know if their API is down and they're frantic. So why do we insist on showing every single person the same exact API docs? Okay. I think your API docs are pretty good now, so we're going to try it again. So if you go back to apidays.readme.com and go. All right, I'm not even going to play a song this time because, yep, okay, so we have one, two, four, okay. So people are already making API requests. We took that down from two minutes and almost no one got one, and now we had a bunch of people making it right away. Now, it might seem we're comparing apples to oranges here. The second version it almost feels like cheating is so easy. But both are just docs for the exact same API. It just happens that one is really easy to use. Our goal is to get our developers to the MVC in the least amount of time. Uh, MVC, I mean the minimum viable call. We want to get them to make some sort of call to our API that means something that matters as quickly as humanly possible. There's so many more ways other than documentation that we can make our API easy to use. For example, uh, now I've talked about I've talked about Roblox a lot this uh, this talk. Um, early on in the talk, we discussed a boulder in your path being a bad kind of hard. Design is important when things go well, but it's even more important when things go badly. So we're going to talk about the API equivalent of that. We're going to talk about error messages. The API equivalent of a boulder in the block or in your way is an error message. Most error messages are very pessimistic, though. They tell you what's wrong, and that's it. But we can do better. 
The nice thing about error messages for us when we're trying not to make breaking changes is that they're very easy to fix without breaking anything. They can be additive. We can just add new fields and it won't break existing calls to APIs. So if you're gonna make just one change to your API, make it this. Add a how to fix it field. Uh, I'd really maybe call it a suggestion field and it's just a paragraph of text that comes with every single error code. So in plain English, just tell the user how to fix the problem. It's gonna be really annoying for you because you have to go through each and every error and write out a sentence or two on how to fix it. But isn't it better that you do it than the user? After all, to your users, the API is a black box that they don't understand. If you can't figure out how to answer the question, how are they supposed to? Your API key's missing? Tell them exactly where to find it. If they're getting an error because something isn't set up, tell them how to set it up. And if they're trying to delete a non-existing resource, show them how to list all existing resources. You won't believe how much better your API is if you just tell people how to fix the problems. Now, if you're gonna make two changes to your API, try to link to a log from each response. Uh, that link should have uh, all the information that the server saw, it should show them docs for the endpoint, it should help them debug, and should be able to be shared with support. Uh, you can build that yourself, or it's a feature of readme if you want to use that. And if you're gonna make three changes to your API messages, uh, at readme I added a unique poem to every single error message just to brighten people's days when things go bad. You probably don't need to do that last one, um, but I'll share a link in the chat after if you want to read through our error code poetry. All right. So anything you can do to turn error into a success will make your API feel magical. Now, speaking of magic, think back to whatever API you said was your favorite API when we uh, closed our eyes and thought about it. It probably felt like a magical experience the first time you used it. In my mind, that's the highest compliment you can give any developer tool. Now, think about a magician. When you see someone do a magic trick, they're following the same laws of physics everyone else is. The difference is that they work really hard to hide away how it's done. You see the beginning and you see the end, and it feels like magic because they obscure the hard part and make it look easy. No amazing developer experience has ever happened by accident. If there's one that you love, it's because someone gave a damn about every single detail, from error messages to documentation, to naming, to syntax, design, to pricing. My favorite definition of magic comes from Penn and Teller, and it sums up this entire talk. Sometimes, magic is just someone spending more time on something than anyone might reasonably expect. That's my talk. If you liked what I said today, uh, well, no. you can follow me at, uh, at Gkoberger. If you really liked what I said, uh, you should all try it read me. It does pretty much everything described here. Uh, we can help out with a bunch more. And if you really, really, really like what we're saying, uh, come work with us. Uh, we are hiring both technical and non-technical positions. All right, we ended a little bit early, but I think that we have uh, some time for Q&A if anyone wants any, uh, has any questions. Cool. Uh, thanks, Greg. Yeah, as um, as Greg mentioned, if anyone has any uh, questions, just put them in the chat. Um, that was that was awesome. I love the songs, by the way. Um, you you talked about giving people um, API logs in the response. So how does this uh, work actually? Uh, yeah. So um, I kind of got this idea from. Uh, Angular. So if anyone's ever used like early Angular versions, which regrettably we still use at README uh, for some stuff, um, I really loved how the error messages, when you got a response, would say like the error is blah, blah, blah. But then it had a link. You click the link and you went to a website and it had like your actual variable name on the website combined with um, long form documentation, how to fix the problem. So they kind of merged your actual prompts so rather than saying, first of all, rather than making you Google it, they actually sent you a link to the docs. And then rather than making you, um, you know, try to compare the docs to, um, you know, what happened to you, they actually like include a stack trace in the URL. So like they actually print out a stack trace and you can see exactly what's wrong and they and they do a ton of really cool stuff. And I was always so inspired by that. I thought that was so cool where um, when you had Angular problems, you never had to Google or try to figure out if it was the right docs or not. They, they gave you a link right in the response and you clicked it and you get a response or get an answer. Um, so we do that at README where if you get an error, um, you can uh, click it and you see a bunch of stuff. You see everything you sent, um, everything up back, you can see exactly what the server saw. There's a bunch of debugging information on it. Um, there's the documentation itself for the endpoint. Um, you can share that link with anyone, so a teammate or with support. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a meme where uh, you know every time you ask support for help uh, for an API, they're always like, "It worked for me," and uh, that's pretty much it. Um, and like having this link means that we don't have to kind of like go back and forth and be like, "Are you using Node or Python or Rails or you know what's going on? Did you encode it this way?" Like you know, both sides can look at the exact same log. Um, it's a feature that we do at README. Uh, we call it API metrics. Um, I haven't seen anyone else really do it, but I know other companies have logs as well. Um, so like you know, Stripe or Twilio, if you do stuff, you can see all the logs. Um, but it's amazing how good a combination of linking to documentation and the log itself is. Um, 
it just makes so many problems go away. Uh, so definitely, uh, it's a lot of work, but um, definitely recommend uh, having some sort of unique URL for each log so people can share it and, and see it and uh, get rid of all the ambiguity of not knowing what happened once the request was, uh, was sent to the, to the server. So I see that um, Brett asked uh, about uh, multiple languages. Um, so uh, not to keep plugging README, but if you use README, we do all the generation for you. Um, there's a few libraries on GitHub as well that will do auto generation. Now I know that auto generation is a little kind of weird, and you don't, and it's not uh, it's not the best. But um, as long as the code snippets are valid, then it doesn't really matter if it's generated or not. Um, or if you can do it by hand, uh, once you do a few languages, it's pretty easy to kind of do the next four to five. Um, and you know, do all your endpoints, but uh, it's not easy, of course, whether you kind of generate it in a nice way um, or if you um, write it by hand, but uh, it's better that you write it by hand uh, or someone on your team than uh, asking each of your customers to do it each time. Because you might write the Ruby example once and that cuts your customers down from having to you know, write a billion times uh, each individually one by one. Um, so it's a lot of work and it's not easy, but uh, I think it's one of the best things you can do for your API um, and adoption of your API. Awesome. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much time. So uh, thanks again for your time, Greg. Appreciate it.